James and the Giant Peach, Chapter 16. And now the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and balancing down the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them, and they screamed and scattered to the right and left as they went hurling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked automobiles as it went by. Then it rushed madly across about 20 fields, breaking down all the fences and hedges in its path, and went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey cows, and then through a flock of sheep, and then through a paddock full of horses, and then through a yard full of pigs, and soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals, stampeding in all directions. The peach was still going at a tremendous speed with no sign of slowing down, and about a mile farther down it came onto a village. Down the main street of the village it rolled, and with people leaping frantically out of its path, left and right, at the end of the street it went crashing through the wall of an enormous building and out the other side, leaving two gaping round holes in the brickwork. This building happened to be a famous factory where they made chocolate, and almost at once a great river of warmed melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes in the factory wall. A minute later, this brown, sticky mess was flowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of houses and into people's shops and gardens. Children were waiting in up into their knees, and some were even trying to swim in it, and all of them were sucking it into their mouths in great, greedy gulps and shrieking with joys. But the peach rushed on across the countryside, on and on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cowsheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hayricks, anything that got in its way went toppling over like a nine pin. An old man sitting quietly behind a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went dashing by, and a woman called Daisy and Whistle was standing so close to it, and as it passed that she had the skin taking off the tip of her nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object would will always keep rolling as long as it is on a downhill slope, and in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean, the same ocean that James had begged his aunts to be allowed to visit the day before. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it every second, and closer also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs were the most famous in the world in the whole of England, and and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them, the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast, and all the men who were in them as well. The peach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff. Now fifty, now twenty, now ten, now five. And when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap up into the sky and hang there suspended for a few seconds, still turning over and over in the air. And then it began to fall. Down, 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 smack! It hit the water with a colossal spat, splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, it came up again, and this time it stayed, floating sincerely upon the surface of the water. Chapter 17 At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of the most instructive indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst a tangled mass of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybug and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travelers had ever had a more terrible journey than those unfortunate creatures. It had started out well, 
with much laughing and shouting. And for the first few seconds, as the peach began to roll slowly forward, no one had minded being tumbled a little bit. And when it went bump, and the centipede shouted, that was Aunt Sponge, and then bump again, that was Aunt Spiker, there had been a tremendous burst of cheering all around. But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go down the steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding madly toward downward, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling and then back on the floor and then sideways against the wall, then up into the ceiling again and up and down and back and forth and round and round. And at the same time, all the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction. And so were the chairs and the sofa, and not to mention the 42 boots belonging to the centipede. Everything and all of them were being rattled around like peas inside an enormous rattle that were being rattled by a mad giant who refused to stop. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lighting system, and the room was in pitchy darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain, and everything kept going round and round. And once James made a frantic grab at some thick bars sticking out from the wall, only to find out they were a couple of the centipede's legs. Let go, you idiot! shouted the centipede, kicking himself free. And James was promptly flung across the room into the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs. A horrid business. And toward the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip. But it was all over now. And the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle himself from everybody else. Let's have some light, shouted the centipede. Yes, they cried. Light, give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best. Please be patient. They all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light began to glimmer out of the glowworm's tail and this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was anyway enough to see some great journey the centipede said limping across the room i shall never be the same again murmured the earthworm nor i said the ladybug it's taken years off of my life but my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful. We are there! Where, they asked. Where is there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper said, but I bet it's somewhere good. We are probably at the bottom of a coal mine, the earthworm said gloomily. We suddenly went down and down and down and down, very suddenly. At the last moment, I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we are in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said. Or the seashore, James said eagerly, with lots of other children down on the sand for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybug, turning a trifle pale. But am I wrong in thinking that we may seem to be bobbing up and down? Bobbing up and down, they cried. Why on earth? What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is everyone ready to go upstairs and take a look around? Yes, yes, they chorused. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of the door in my bare feet, the centipede said. I have to get my boots on first. For heaven's sakes, let's not go through all that nonsense again, the earthworm said. Let's all lend the centipede a hand and get it over with, the ladybug said. Come on. They all did, except Miss Spider, who set about weaving a long rope ladder that would reach from the floor up to a hole in the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had widely, wisely said that they must not risk going out the side of the entrance when they didn't know 
where they were. But first, must all go up onto the top of the peach and have a look around. So half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung, the 42nd boot had been laced neatly onto the centipede's 42nd foot. They were all ready to go out. Amidst mounting and excitement and shouts of, here we go, boys, the promised land. I can't wait to see it. The whole company climbed the ladder one by one and disappeared into dark, soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically upward. Chapter 18. A minute later, they were out in the open, standing on the very top of the peach near the stem, blinking their eyes in strong sunlight and peering around nervously. What happened? Where are we? But this is impossible. Unbelievable. Terrible. I told you we were bobbing up and down, the ladybug said. We're in the middle of the sea, cried James. And indeed they were. A strong and high current wind had carried the peach so quickly away from the shore that already the land was out of sight. All around them, they, the vast black ocean, deep and hungry. Little waves were bibbling around against the side of the peach. But how did it happen, they cried. Where are the fields? Where are the woods? Where is England? Nobody, not even James, could understand how in the world a thing like this could come about. Ladies and gentlemen, the old green grasshopper said, trying to, very hard to keep the fear and disappointment out of his voice. I am afraid that we find ourselves in a rather awkward situation. Awkward, cried the earthworm. My dear girl grasshopper, we are finished. Every one of us is about to perish. I may be blind, you know, but that much I can see quite clearly. Off with my boots, shouted the centipede. I cannot swim with my boots on. I can't swim at all, cried the ladybug. Nor can I, wailed the glowworm. Nor I, said Miss Spider. None of us three girls can swim a single stroke. But you wouldn't have to swim, James said calmly. We are floating beautifully, and sooner or later a ship is bound to come along and pick us up. They all stared at him in amazement. Are you quite sure that you are not, we are not sinking? The ladybug asked. Of course I'm sure, answered James. Go and look for yourselves. They all ran over to the side of the peach and peered down at the water below. The boy is quite right, the old green grasshopper said. We are floating beautifully. Now we must all sit down and keep perfectly calm. Everything will be all right in the end. What an absolute nightmare, cried the earthworm. Nothing is ever all right in the end. And well, you know it. Poor earthworm, the lazy bug said, whispering in James's ear. He loves to make everything into a disaster. He hates to be happy. He is only happy when he is gloomy. Now, isn't that odd? But then I suppose just being an earthworm is enough to make a person pretty gloomy. Don't you agree? If this peach is not going to sink, the earthworm was saying, and we are not going to be drowned, then every one of us is going to starve to death instead. Do you realize that we haven't had a thing to eat since yesterday morning? By golly, he's right, cried the centipede. For once, earthworm is right. Of course I'm right, the earthworm said, and now we're not likely to find anything around here either. We shall get thinner and thinner and thirstier and thirstier, and we shall all die a slow and grisly death from starvation. I'm dying already. I am slowly shriveling up for want of food, but personally, I would rather go drown. But good heavens, you must be blind, said James. You know very well I'm blind, snapped the earthworm. There's no need to rub it in. I didn't mean that, said James quickly. I'm sorry, but can't you see that? See, shouted the poor earthworm. How can I see if I'm blind? James took a deep, slow breath. Can't you realize, he said, patiently, that we have enough food here to last us for weeks and weeks? Where, they said, where? Of course, the peach. Our whole ship is made of food, 